name is Terrence Metz. I'm the lead curriculum developer for MG Rush. We focus on structured facilitation with a strong emphasis on decision making, prioritization, and decision quality. You're about to experience a very tiny portion of hundreds of tools and tips available to you through our public fast professional facilitation class. Today's lesson is on roles and responsibilities and how you might convert those into what is known in the project world as a Gantt chart. We would begin with a matrix and that matrix would line out what needs to be done to reach our goals and objectives. And to do that effectively, Dr. Tufte says, make sure you take something such as grid lines, put them in a secondary color, so it recedes in the background. You want your primary information to pop out at you. Primary information, of course, is who does what, the primary thing we're assigning here. We actually can take from our prior step called alignment, because now we've agreed upon certain actions, such as this new product launch, such as the new customer relationship management process, etc. And as you may recall, we added number seven, number eight in the last lesson. Those assignments need to be made against who's in this room right now. It's not fair to assign something to somebody not in the room, but please use their titles, departments, or business units as opposed to individual names. We array them across the x-axis, the who, because typically we have less people and resource to do stuff with and more stuff to do. You could invert these if that was not the case. The who in our case might be something like the project manager, the business analyst, etc. We're going to build what is called roles and responsibilities, frequently called a RACI chart. We've actually identified 17 different varieties of RACI, RACI, RASCI, Paris, Ulrich, RACIT, LACTI, I could go on and on. We're going to keep our demonstration today simple. As facilitators, of course, we're agnostic. We can embrace any one of those flavors. We need to know what the culture expects. The simplest form uses an R and A and S and an I. We want to know who's responsible for each of these actions. We want to know who's being held accountable, typically for the entire uh, set of actions. We need to know who's going to support the person being responsible. And we need to know who else maybe just needs to be informed. In this case, A implies R, implies S, implies I. That means if I'm being held accountable, I'm also responsible. I'm clearly supporting it, and I need to be informed about it. R implies S, implies I. That means if I'm responsible, I'm clearly supporting it, and I need to be informed about it. And S implies I, meaning if I'm supporting it, I also need to be informed about it. Leveraging those symbols, the suggestion for most uh, methodologies is to make sure you work in a vertical fashion so that in case the meeting ends, we at least leave the room knowing who's going to be responsible for each of these. And that uses what's called the big red R. Now, if, in fact, there's one person paying for it all, just a good idea to footnote that, and frequently that is the case. If there are separate groups or business units accountable, you can mention those accordingly. Suggestion now is to go back with the time remaining to find out the relative relationships of other roles. For example, here the PM may be supporting it, the business analyst needs to be informed about it, it could be you have blanks, it could be you have multiples, but we're simply finding out now what is appropriate in all the other cells. We conducted a session with a major uh, Fortune 500 company beginning at 8 o'clock in the morning one, one day. Started with two sheets wide, three sheets high. It's one of, the, one of not the only, but one of the few times we facilitated beginning on a ladder. At 3.30 in the afternoon, we finished, and the vice president was thrilled. She said, you know, we have a little time left over. Let's go back and figure out when these are going to be done. That's an excellent question. We had to add extra paper because we weren't ready for it at the time. But from that day forward, I've learned 
the power of the cell. We don't have to use all of that space for our big red R. We can, in fact, split this into four separate spaces. Once we know that, in fact, the PM is going to be responsible, we can capture that sense of responsibility. We can address her question by simply asking approximately when will this be complete? And here we're simply representing time with a little clock. And the two additional questions worth asking might be, how much resource do you need to support this? Because typically somebody being responsible is certainly not clueless. They do have a guess or estimate. Finally, we could ask how much labor is required to bring it to fruition. And the term we use and is frequently used is called FTE. If you're unfamiliar with FTE, one FTE is one person for one year. That's equivalent to 12 people for one month or 52 people for one week. They're all equal to one FTE, which is approximately 2,000 hours per year. You can imagine leaving a room with all of your actions assigned in terms of who's responsible, who's supporting it, who needs to be informed about it, approximately when will it be done, approximately within a certain range, plus or minus 15, 25 or 50 percent, how much money is required, and approximately how much labor is involved you have, in essence, what is called a Gantt chart. It's a project plan, and from this moment forward, we can actually get to work. Again, this roles and responsibilities, the power of the cell, is one of hundreds of tools and tips available to you through the FAST professional facilitation training. Our next lesson in this sequence is naturally, now that we know who's doing what, what are we going to tell the world about what happened in this meeting? We call that guardian of change, and we look forward to seeing you.